I must confess to you guys, I don't like housekeeping. I'm not good in dishwashing, I don't like any kind of cleaning and brooming and vacuum cleaner and washing clothes. But I have to do it because I want my house to look great. I want it to look great every time I go into. So from time to time I need to do it and it's like every other project if you want it to keep it clean keep it working keep it good you need to do some really routines regularly and you know that's what my next guest is doing because he owns the brand which is very well known in the world of Eurovision it's 11 year old and it's called we we blocks and we love it we like it we are curious about their ideas, of the ideas of their audience as well. And these are some of those topics we were talking about with my next guest, the founder of Bibliblogs, William Lee Adams. So, so welcome William, welcome to my show. I'm super glad that you, that you take time, you make time for me, for being here even in those such weird circumstances we all have. And when I was doing my research for, for this interview, I was really surprised how the big part of your life, the Wibi Blocks, is 11 year old, established in 2009. And I was curious about how it changed your life, but how it changed itself as well. Because like in 2009, comparing to 2020, it's a big, big growth, the different technologies appeared. The website probably changed a lot. And I must, I must confess that that's the older, that's the older thing that my knowledge of Eurovision. So I'm really curious what you're gonna tell me. Well, first of all, it's nice to see you in a different context. We've seen each other at Eurovision for so yeah. many years, but nice to see you here at home. Um, in terms of Eurovision, it's it's just changed so much along with the technology. I think back in 2009, blogs um, were much more prevalent in a way. The word blog. Whereas today, <clears throat> websites are more like news channels, you know, and it's gone from sort of a personal project to like a media project. Um, and you see that in movie blogs going from one person to now we have about 65 volunteers around the world. And there are hundreds of applications, but I just can't read them all because there's no time. Um, it, so yeah, you go from being very much on your own to kind of having a community. And I think the internet has really facilitated that. Um, back then in 2009, it was all print for us. I didn't want to do video, it was terrifying to me. And Debin, who you'll know, one of our bloggers and YouTubers, around 2011, he's like, we should be doing video, babes. We've got to do video. And I was like, oh, I don't wanna, I don't wanna do that. So he would go do interviews with people who weren't even in Eurovision. They were musicians who he wanted to go to Eurovision. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he would meet them backstage. And um, yeah, and then I realized that in many ways, YouTube was a bit easier, like you turn on the camera, you speak, it's really one take usually, and you're done. Whereas with the words, because I've always been a print journalist, it was more like, oh, do it again. Do it. I was too in myself, too kind of um, doing it again and again and again. And that's very draining. So in many ways, YouTube was freeing, but we didn't get active in YouTube until 2015, honestly. Um, and I think back then, 2013, 2014, people just wanted to see performances. It was the dominant thing to do on Eurovision YouTube channels was just to upload clips of performances. But then in 2015, we started doing, you know, opinion and reaction, which was sort of the basis of the print version of Wooby Blogs. It was always about having, you know, an angle, looking at something and giving an opinion, like an editorial section of a newspaper or, um, yeah. It, so, so in 2015, when YouTube came around, that sort of helped our growth, I guess you could say. How did this change? Did, how did, did this change things? Because like for you and... I, I'm just gonna speak as a like former head of delegation and probably even like speak for lots of my colleagues, not probably all of them, but for some that we of course watching our videos because we are curious what you think about our work or the work of our artists. How do you you know, how do you see it from your from from your point of view, uh, how the stagings are made or what they're gonna be when we all knew it like you know, months probably before, and, and but we're still curious 
Let me do a good job. And uh, how do how do how do you feel influential in this in this world, uh, which you which you helped create it as well? Ah, it's really interesting to hear from your side. Um, I think early on, when we knew maybe no one was watching, it was easier to be free and just. You know, because you didn't feel there was any real world consequence, I guess. And you see this more broadly with YouTube. But now, you know, we know that people watch because people will say, oh, they'll come up after rehearsals and say, oh, I saw this or that. And so you have to, um, I don't want to say responsibility, but you have to balance being honest with also people have feelings as well. And so it's striking a balance. Um, and that's why I like having many different people. Like we do these we we jury reviews with different opinions. And I like that because everyone's being honest, but everyone has a different opinion. And so you see a kind of greater survey, I guess, of opinion. Um, it, it's just weird because this is the internet again. It's reactive, right? You yeah. know, in the old days when I worked at a magazine, you write the article, it goes out and kind of you don't really know what anyone thinks until someone writes a letter to the editor which takes weeks and by then <laughs> the story is old but now with youtube it's like instantly you see comments and you see people reacting and it, it's so much more in real time um it can be quite stressful to be honest um it's you know sometimes you have to say hard things y you know an hod or you know an artist or you know the songwriter somehow you have a connection yeah. and um but you still have to be honest because that's what you do and that can be a little bit awkward but i think generally and you'll know this as an hod i think most hod's are actually they're very professional people who don't take it personally they understand opinion is just an opinion they don't get all too emotional obviously everyone whether they admit it or not has an emotional connection to the work they do on some level um, but I think for the most part, the HOD certainly is very mature. This is like a fully formed adult who <laughs> accepts and understands criticism and is interested in criticism. Well, There's an art. So that's not that's not quite easy sometimes, you know, to to take it. Sometimes you say, just say, well, what the bullshit, you know. I uh, I must say we of course we're people, so we we can take it really personally sometimes. But but you then must imagine yourself, and I will I always do. Uh, imagining myself in your role and starting to tell opinion if you just dislike something is it gonna be great in this environment for me will they just talk to me again or whatever but i think your position is evolved into something like bigger or better maybe it's it's just this just this just uh i don't know the the growth of your site uh, the influence of baby blogs or or how you present it and how we feel it's it's big or maybe the biggest and maybe it's how professionally you're you're evolving the channel each year you know i i can see it so maybe even that this just just make a big difference but anyway i can assure you that we can take things personally of course we're normal people so so but it, it does it, it it shouldn't stop you for 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 commenting what you like or how you like and i think that that what you say professionalism should appear and of course you know that 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 just just my just my point of view that 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 what, what i can give you a feedback on it of course we we read it and we have our opinions and we of course love love our work to do and sometimes you're you're point something really good out and sometimes it's just a miss shot kind of you know because like you're commenting something which is very different from from what you think but you can't know so so that's quite 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 nice to to talk right now because that's just changed the position as well because normally you were interviewing with me you know and this is this is quite cool so I have a different question for you which 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 I probably will ask all of all of people I will be talking with it's the COVID situation how did it affect your work especially the Eurovision one. Mm. So I guess on the personal level, it was really deeply upsetting because you sort of you're on this journey, as you know, and you're running, you're on the course and you're passing the baton between each other and you're all working towards this goal. And then someone kind of trips you, in this case, a virus. And, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm just glad I have my health. I'm glad, you know, everyone I know has their health. So this is the starting point. We're all alive and doing well and coping. So that's the most important. But of course, 
if you move past that and think about your personal life, we all wanted to be at Eurovision to see our friends, etc. Um, and that was quite hard because it, it disrupts the year, the flow, your goals. We had arranged many special things for Rotterdam. Uh, we were going to have our biggest Wee Wee Jam party ever. We had, um, you know, I, I don't want to give away too much because we might do it next year, but we had a residency planned at a location for two weeks with TV crew. It, it was going to be our biggest Eurovision ever. And we had all this planned. And then, of course, it all goes away. And you understand that it has to go away. I believe the EBU made the correct decision. You could not have Eurovision in this changing situation that was very new and dangerous, frankly. Um, so there's no bad feeling toward any you know, organization, but it was just kind of, it's like having the rug pulled from underneath you. And then also there's a financial implication because what people don't realize often is the more popular your website becomes and the more traffic you get, the more money you have to pay for your server. Like you need a solid server. And in the past, maybe 2012 to 2017, I was on a cheaper server. And it was because I didn't want to, I just couldn't spend the money. And so the site would always crash at popular moments. It was very stressful. I would become a monster, like literally like a, a child, like why is my baby dying on the most, and I had to get over it. And so I upgraded to a very expensive server and so I had, you know, these partnership deals and things we do, sponsorships, it's just to pay down the expenses of the website. This is not me with a bag of money <laughs> running off. It's to pay our bills. There's overhead. And I think people don't always see that. They see, you know, brought to you by, and they assume you're buying a house. <laughs> but that's not the case. You're paying your server fee, which is more than my mortgage on my house, just to let you know. Like, it's not cheap. It, this is, it, 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 when you get to a certain volume, you have to pay. And we're lucky that we're in a position, yes, you need a higher server, but then you can also get, you know, advertising or something to help cover it. So in the end, luckily, now it balances out, yeah. but um, it's very stressful. And so that, obviously, I still had the expenses of my server, but I didn't have the sponsorship to pay for the server. So that was a little stressful, but luckily, you know, it's fine. The difference will come down. So have you thought about some like donation system or, uh, or uh... Yeah, so it's interesting. I, I've always just gone kind of the advertising route because if I start asking <coughs> readers for money, I feel that it creates a weird, I never want to charge readers for the service. And I think this goes back to me working in magazines. I remember when I worked at Time Magazine for many years and they put up a paywall on the website and even I was offended. I was like, you're gonna make people pay for this content? And it, uh, I don't know, I just think information should be free. I really believe in this. At the same time, I do see the clear financial struggles. You know, at the magazine I worked at, we had 60 people when I started in London. And then when I left, there were only three, just because advertising, the, the climate, the economic climate. So I do see the demands on the publishing side. But I don't know, for this website, I've always wanted it to be built around a community and I just don't wanna ask people to pay. No. What about what about like pat Patreons or something like that, which is very different like system. True. Yeah. I something holds me back from asking for donations. I don't know if it's like me being <laughs> I don't know. I for now I just want to try to keep it um because people do actually on our YouTube channel, we have live chat sometimes, particularly during Eurovision, and people will make donations in the super chat, I think they call it, which is quite nice. Um and so that's been an important element as well, actually. So in a way, that's my Patreon, but less structured, <laughs> kind of informal. But no, I do take your point. It's a great way. And I think particularly for sites that can't, if, it, if sites don't have the traffic to get the clicks to help pay down the bill, I think Patreon is really good. Um, maybe I will explore it. We'll see how this post-COVID debt works out. Fingers crossed for it. I don't, I, don't really, I don't really think it's a shame. I don't even, I don't know, like, two, three years, maybe five years ago, it was something like, uh, I think nowadays this, this opinion about, about like paid service or uh, donation service, donation help or uh, whatever is good, especially when you're super clear with your viewers, with your readers and tell them like, all right, so uh, like how you're clear with me, you know, the expenses for the, for the website are, are higher than I can, I can afford. So if I can bring you back like the same service without without just work my ass off, you know, yeah, well, I I just need your help.
kind of, or, or maybe the server is going to be just smaller or lower, especially probably because I was checking the, the, the views numbers on YouTube nowadays. It's not like, of course, from, from my side when my YouTube is just, just starting and it's nothing big. It, it, it's, it's high, super high numbers, but when I can compare your numbers, when the Eurovision is more in a drive, it works, flows, it has its finishes, and I don't know, some echoes, you know, from, from, uh, from it each year. So your numbers are much big, much higher than I can see, I can see now. So I can see that affected even this contest. So what actually, actually what I'm curious about, what are you planning to write about right now? Of course, there's junior Eurovision. So this is, a th this can be a theme, but as, as well as countries don't share much about their selection. So, so it's kind of like a, like a void gap or something around. So, so how, how you're trying to fill it? Yeah, it's a good question. So on some level, um, we, we do have kind of back channels in a number of delegations who will kindly drip feed us information, which gives us <laughs> things to write about. Um, we do sort of rumor post about who's coming up. We'll talk about new music from artists of the past, um, artists hinting they may want to participate, rule changes in different contests like San Remo is adapting to COVID-19. How does this massive Italian festival change? Um, so there's not as much news, but there's still enough to keep us going. And we recently started focusing more on our podcast, which gives us something else to play with, a different medium. I think for me, the big thing about Eurovision, yes, it's the content and the songs, but it's more so about this media event. Like what really interests me is this big media event, how it's covered, you know, the controversies, how different countries hold it in different to different levels of importance. Um, it's that element like during the final of eurovision i'm watching but i'm still much more interested in what's happening around me like seeing mm. people in the press room and so in that sense this is a really interesting period as an observer to see how will the countries cope with covid in the context of entertainment um how, which countries will go full throttle uh, you know in norway right now they've announced the rules and they're going to have reduced audience or maybe no audience depending on the yeah. rules at the time Who knows what's going to happen in half a year yeah, it's so unpredictable. And, it, and so it's, it's a completely different dimension this year. Um, and in terms of reaction videos, you know, it, there are fewer national selections. There's less to react to, <laughs> which is a little sad. Um, but no, we're staying plenty busy um, because the, the people, you know, from the last year of Vision, we, we know, you know, half of the artists for next year, basically. So we can follow them closely and see what they're doing and make predictions. Um, it's a different route but I think it will still be interesting. I'm really interested in another thing. It's like, I've never been to this press room from your side. When I was a journalist, like for, for, for video games, I I was there, but it's something else. It's, some, it's, it's different than, than this kind of passion. And I always see on all of you journalists, how how your eyes just sparkling, you know, like like, like the little flames in, their, in your eyes anything's happening like that, that's something that, that I love about this this contest and I would like to ask you I think that each year this like press room or the bubble and all of it around is very improved or changed a bit for for, for, for you to to have a more comfort I think that, that that that's from my from my point of view what I, I think how it is I'm not sure if it, if, it, if it's right if I'm right I really hope but if there's anything you would like to be changed or or upgraded, uh, the best thing you miss, whatever, what, what it should be. So I think one thing that has changed, and I hope it continues to change even more, is that in the past there used to be a lot of a lot of waste. People delegations would come with thousands of CDs and t-shirts and paper and just things that ended up getting thrown away and creating waste and I, I see a cd now and i just think it inside think of it inside a baby whale you know i don't know i find it all really just wasteful and it, it's to the point that a lot of the accreditations at eurovision aren't journalists necessarily but to kind of super fans and i think there should definitely be a special 
access area for fans 100%. But I think in the press room, I, I kind of wish it was more working press, to be honest, because when you are there as a journalist, journalist, and there are many journalists there, I'm not saying they're not, but it's, it, there's this tension between people who want to do work and cover the contest and people who just want to collect CDs or, you know, take a selfie with oh, the yeah. star. And it, it's, this, it's a very palpable tension. And so I think they should kind of readjust maybe just have a special fan area where fans get special access and that way you have people who actually want to work work to work work because i so many times i've been in the press room you know in the final hour and it's just me and my fellow bloggers there like everyone else has left to go party because you know and that's fine that's perfectly fine eurovision should be a celebration but you know in the working area it should be for working journalists i think um so anyways yes i think by passing out less tapped <laughs> you in a way discourage um, the kind of that, you know, I think journalists are there regardless of whether they're CDs and free t-shirts, um, whereas others are maybe less interested. But I, I do love the press room, as you say, the, the flame in your eyes, as you say. It's quite nice because everyone in that room is watching this rehearsal for the first time together. And, you know, they're surprised when someone does really well or shocked when someone who was supposed can to do you, well. Can you tell me the feelings? How was how it when you, when you just first to see it? Oh my God, you know, it's like, it so I covered the Olympics when they were in London and I remember going to the women's gymnastics and watching the people on the balance beam, right? The four inches and you're so scared they're gonna fall off and like break their neck or break their leg. And then you're covering your eyes and then they dismount wow. and they land and you're like, oh! it's very similar to Eurovision. Cause it's, you know, it's three minutes and they walk out like Australia. Let's talk about Australia 2019. Cause we did Oh yes, lady on stick. And when you hear that, you're like, oh, well, that, that's going to be a disaster. But then you see it. It was so surprising. It was so different. And I just remember some people around me gasping, like, oh. and you know something's good when everyone goes quiet. Like, people were quiet because it was just so amazing. Um, it, it's, it, it really is like a chemical reaction. You mm -hmm. know, like if you're really scared and like you have adrenaline, you sometimes get that feeling if it's your favorite or if it's, you know, a song you really like. Um, and I often get that for like the smaller countries because I always root for the underdog. It's like you always, I know mean, a lot of people at Eurovision always want the, the country that's not got the best reputation or the best record to do well. And I remember 2016, Bulgaria, Apali Genova, people were, we were all blown away. And it was such a wonderful feeling because people didn't know what to expect from Bulgaria. Because in the past, maybe they had good songs, but their staging wasn't so good. But then in 2016, everything was coming together. And it, it's like euphoria, to, to use a cliche, you know, Laureen. It's like you feel this euphoria. Well, it is, but we all love it. I, I remember I remember her sing, singing on Ceremonial in Stockholm, and we were just blown off. It was something like, wow. And, you know, that, that just come from the mouth of a person living in the country where no one really knows that that this song has come from Eurovision. It's still hard work here in front of us. So uh, I can understand this feeling. And you know, even I remember um, you were the head of delegation in 2016, yes? Yes. With Martina Barta? No, 20 no, it was 17. 17 with Martina Barta. And I remember, although there was mixed reaction, there was great surprise at the staging you had done. It was almost futuristic. It looked very, um, I didn't expect this. Well, I think, we, I, I really think we better fucked it up. We, we thought about like different feeling it will, it will bring in, but we just didn't do our work that properly broadly or something, but that can happen. You know, for us, it was a breaking point for make a lot of changes in what we're doing. So, uh, and it helped a lot. I think the Eurovision since then really improved here, like a lot, like even among artists and whatever, but that's not the, actually, that's a topic for, for me. It's a new question actually, which I'm really curious about your point of view of how countries improving or, or, or the otherwise decreasing what they're doing, the expectation change. You know, there are like few favorites like Russia, Sweden, each year, like few of those like top countries. But then something happens and the favorite change among the fans, like in general, how, how this works actually. You know, I think there's no science to it. I think it, it's very much like an art. You, you can't, you can't contrive it too much, but I think you can do certain things. So like in the Czech Republic, I think you did two things that were very smart. 
First was your online selection created community buzz, like on a grassroots level, like you created a buzz domestically. And I do think it's contagious. And so when you see people on Twitter or YouTube in the Czech Republic, you know, getting excited about these artists in their own country, it has a knock on effect. So people abroad are like, ooh, what are the Czechs talking about? And then the second thing was you actually had good songs. I mean, that, it's just, so, it's so obvious, but it was those two things together feed each other. Cause you know, you have, we are poop, for instance, we all poop. <laughs> In this video, it was so ambitious, the music video, and it created so much talk, but then other people were disgusted by it. And that's okay, because- You, you were, uh, I remember that. Oh, I, I thought this was first, amazing. First, I love- First one, I, I, I saw it, then. yeah, it was great. Oh, this, your, that selection, I gotta tell you, because Benny Cristo really grew on me. Like, by the end, I was like, I get this. It, it, was, it was so diverse. And this is the other thing, your selection had completely different songs, you know, these emotional ballads, these avant-garde ballads, and then this rock, poop, veganism, and then yeah. Benny Cristo, whose sound is global, really. It, it's European, but it draws on African roots, and just so much going on. So, yeah, you managed to create domestic buzz with good songs, and because it's online, it's accessible to Europeans broadly. This is a very good strategy, and I think it's one that's affordable as well. Like, we all love a big national selection. We all love this. But, yeah, me, especially. <laughs> but you did a good job using your resources, I think. I mean, I, I don't know if the online selection is an issue of resource or, or not, but it, it worked, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think some, somehow it worked. I think what, 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 what really helped that we just said, artists, just do just good music. We won't say, you, we won't tell you what we want. Just do whatever. That's maybe why it was diverse because they just didn't have the catch of oh they want they they prefer this over this because we didn't. And that's mm -hmm. that that's that's the philosophy we have. Like we 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 don't talk to your art. Just just do that's that's your problem. You know that's your problem. So so I think that all countries actually should do similar similar way. Just let let artists do their thing and not not just chain them with Eurovision brands and then every everybody just do the same songs each year similar but you know you never you never know but uh i was I curious agree, yeah. about your your opinion mostly about like like actually like like big five countries you know you're you're living in london uk for me it's ununderstandable kindly and frankly to to that they do understand or they do just don't send the best the, like there is like every second artist is probably the best. It's the biggest market in the world if we don't count the US and Asia, which is very different. But uh, this is for me something which kind of tears me apart because I just don't understand it. So what's how how you see it? Because you're you're working in the BBC actually, Cow for BBC. So you you're insider. Oh, it's so complicated. I think one issue is that because the UK is such a dominant pop music market, that means that the role of Eurovision is perceived, perceived to be less, you know? People say, we have Dua Lipa, we, we have Ed Sheeran, we have all these people, so why do we need this? And it creates this weird dichotomy where people are chasing the Ed Sheeran level of fame and the Ed Sheeran level of wealth, and they think Eurovision is this, you know, side piece talent show. They think of, you know, X Factor or The Voice. They don't they're not putting it on an elevated level. And also, and I think this is very, very important, for so many years, UK viewers were taught to make fun of Eurovision through Terry Wogan, the old commentator. Mm -hmm. As the UK did less well in the results, you know, in, through the 90s, putting Katrina to the side and then into the noughties, there was this attitude of, oh, they don't like us. And he fed this attitude through his commentary saying it was all block voting, they don't like the UK. And so viewers grew up learning to watch Eurovision this way. Like this feeling inside. Yeah, this negativity, really. And in the media, obviously the tabloid papers, they want to get readers and they want to get clicks. So they echo what the people are saying. So then they say, oh, Eurovision is, is trash. Eurovision, is, it's a, a big game, we'll never win, they hate us. And then people repeat that again. And so it becomes this very vicious cycle. And that's where the UK is. It's caught in this cycle. However, 
there have been glimmers of hope. Certainly at the BBC, there is an effort at least in recent years that, you know, they've, they've tried different things. So mm -hmm. they, they make an effort to do something. It hasn't always worked. And I think a lot of that's come down to the song choices that have been presented. There is no artistic freedom. I, I think they choose some song. We know this for a fact because artists have said so. Artists are told to sing certain songs and it's playing to a very, I don't know, X Factors winner single. It's not original is what I'm trying to say. Great artist. Even these, these artists in this selection in the UK, they're not necessarily known, but they can sing. Many of them have charisma. It's just the song, it's not their art. You know, this is not a situation like in the Czech Republic earlier. You said, this is your art, do your thing. That doesn't seem to be an option. It's much more, here is the song you will sing. And I think if you don't have the freedom, you don't have that authenticity, it comes through. Because the authenticity element, Portugal, Salvador Sobral, totally him, totally him, not Eurovision, and he oh, wins. Yeah. You know, and I think that that's the X factor. It's like responding to your, you know, Yeleni. For, for... I think actually Salvador was was the person who really helped a lot of delegations to show that it doesn't really matter. You know, that even like if you like it or not, he was just himself, as you said. And maybe that's it. Maybe that that's it. Maybe that's maybe that's not it for somebody else. You know, but that's the that's 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 the thing. I really really like when. Somebody said, this is the great winning song. It's like, okay, but we don't know what other 40 countries will bring in. How can you say that? It's always like a career. So when, when you were saying that you were sitting in a press room watching the first rehearsal, I was sitting in the bubble and watching other countries and say, well, this is a great idea. Or, well, this is just, this, this will not work, whatever they do. But of, that's how it is. That's how it is. But, but lots of times it was really inspiring when, when seeing it even in my work, how other different countries just approach the same problem, the same thing, you know, the, the drama queen uh, artist, it can happen. It's not everything, it's not that, 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 that pink and that, that smooth and that nice as it seems, but I think everybody tries. And that brings me to question, how was it among fans? Because like, I sometimes feel there are a lot of like, like uh, fights between fan clubs and hates and you know competition dislikes. So how is it really like, or how is it like from your opinion? Again, please be honest. It's so interesting. So I think the conversations we see online are often very different to the conversations we see in person in the press room. Because in the press room, it's a very collegial atmosphere. People are very friendly. People are very open. People are very enthusiastic and happy. Part of that, of course, is just you're at Eurovision, which is like Christmas for everyone. You know, it kind of brings out your, be your best feelings. Um, but also, I think on social media, one reason, and particularly the Eurovision fandom, the reason it can get so heated is almost everyone is communicating in a second language. You know, you've got people who are native English speakers pe speaking to people who are maybe, you know, English as a third language and they can't see each other's face. And so there's so much miscommunication and just subtle things. You know, you say something in English that's not offensive at all, but then it's taken as offensive by someone who maybe doesn't know the idiom. And then they can't see that you're smiling when you type it. It's, there are just these factors, you know, outside of the actual content of Eurovision that make it so difficult. Um, I think another level is sometimes the people who speak the loudest, we take them as being, you know, the word, you know, this person is angry, therefore everyone is angry. When in reality, I think most people are just silent. There's like a silent majority. Um, cause, yeah, just be, for instance, if I look at the likes on a tweet and then I look at the clicks on a website, you know, a, a tweet may have so many likes, but then the website, our website, it doesn't get many views, but then a tweet we send out that has you know, no likes will have all these views. It's so hard to gauge the reality, I guess, beyond the social media post. But yes, to your point, there is a lot of fighting. And I think it's because in any fandom, whether that's video games or, you know, sports, football, whatever, passions run very, very high, just so high. And I think with art, like, it, it's so subjective, right? In, in football, you can say, he literally fell down, he missed the goal, so he deserved to lose. Whereas mm -hmm. with art, you don't have someone kicking a ball. It, it's so subjective. 
there's more room for anger, I guess, <laughs> because it's harder to, to explain a result when there's not a simple point, like a, a ball going in a net, oh, yeah. you know? It's a singer singing and she may sound good to you, but horrible to me. It, so it creates all this confusion and um, yeah. And then Twitter magnifies all of this just because again, you don't see anyone's face and people are not always communicating in the same language or they don't always have the same sense of humor. It, 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 it's very, I, I've actually stepped away from it all. I kind of, I don't check at mentions anymore. I don't, because there are people who, um, you know, they go online and maybe they're hurting. So they want to hurt someone else. And you see this all the time and it sounds like pop psychology, but you know, it's true actually. And my degree is actually in psychology. And so I try to be very empathetic when I see these really, you know, things that are untru blatantly untrue and you know, they're untrue because someone says something about you and you're like, never met you. We've never spoken. And like, factually, that's just like not true, but there's no point in getting in a big argument because this person clearly has some motivation for doing that. So you have to step back and kind of breathe deep and just say, okay, they're gonna do their thing. Those who hurt others usually hurt the most. It's so cliche, but it's so true. And I just try to be empathetic really. And like, she's going through something, she's having her moment, he's having his moment. And you just have to step away. It, it, Cause if you get sucked into the vortex, it's a very dark place. <laughs> and yeah. I, I don't wanna be there. I, you I know. Don't know. Yeah. It's yeah. The whole anonymity thing, oh, I'm anonymous, I don't have to see you in real life. They forget you're a person, actually. A lot of people, and this is, again, not just about Eurovision, this is anything. People are talking to a tweet. You know, they don't think they're talking to a person. And so they'll say things they would never say to anyone in real life because it's cruel. It's unusual. Um, Can yeah. you give me an example? Oh, there's so many. Um, let me there's say. probably some, some of your favorites. Mm. Okay. Um... Okay, there's there, there was yes. So I was on. I won't name the specific country, but I was on a jury. You know, as with you, we've seen each other at these jury events, and then there'll be tweets. You know, William going home with his suitcase full of money. <laughs> you know, and it, as you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> having sat on these juries, it's just the it's it's so fictional. It's it's so you know. Oftentimes, you're taking time off work to go beyond these things in my case. And so you're actually in some ways losing money by going. Um, and then of course, yes, you know, your plane ticket will be covered for whatever, but then you end up making incidental expenses. It's not what people think is my point. Um, and yet, or another example, um, you were told to vote that way. And then there'll be this whole narrative about four years ago, he liked a tweet which featured the flag of this country. You know, the, the, these conspiracy theories. And it's almost like people are playing an online board game. And they're, they're trying to connect all these dots for fun. Um, but yeah, as you know, it doesn't work that way. You kind of go, you hear some songs, you go with your heart. In certain countries, they tell you, vote on staging, voice. Uh, uh, yeah, they just tell you like what's what should be the, the thing you should watch for the most because like you're pro there. But you know, I think, I think it's still a super subjective thing, but just, I, like, like I can't imagine. Like, I, I, you know, I know the environment when everything is very expensive just to make the show run. Why should they pay you to vote for some? They, they, I, I think most producers they just don't really care who's gonna win because they're for fans of everyone, or maybe they hope that the favorite won't win because it's an asshole. You know, I don't know. It, it's a super combination, but to give you money, not to probably they will give you money not to vote for someone. But it's never gonna happen because why? My God, why? Conflict when I was, I just saw it's funny that both sides accusing the other side for the same thing. Even I, I, I don't know about the conflict too much, but there was the, the quote, the hashtag freedom of speech, and I was commented like this is really funny because like in not only your country is the really freedom of speech, and then some fun wrote me on on Instagram and read me like why are you why are you the fun of Azerbaijan, right? I was like, what? How? 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 What? You know. And so I can understand that that whatever you actually say, when somebody wants to hear something from it, have his own opinions already made, and it just fits to everything you, you do. So, so I, I do understand. I was really curious about like your your point of view at this because like 
whatever we do, like head of delegations or or the the TV TV professionals working on Eurovision from the, for the countries or EBU or 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 the broadcaster who's just doing it in in the country, you you are viewed by thousands of people. And we are unknown, you know, you're the known person, you're kind of a voice, or you can be, or, or your colleagues can be voice of Eurovision somehow much better than, than us. So I really was curious about how your environment really, really works. Because like I heard a lot of stories like Weebly blogs are, they're just, you know, faking their numbers or uh, they're not the big as they are. And I always just say like, I don't really care, like what? And I must say that your presentation is probably the best among those websites, I think. But uh, that means not that means really nothing in the way you're all important. You are all important to me. I would be really glad that you all much cooperate more. Maybe that there won't be the problems with the servers. You know, if you cooperate more, whatever you know, it, 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 because like I think that that the Eurovision power should connect us all, even like you, and to even more understand what we do in the process and you know to even maybe to help us to get rid of those speculation like hey he has a bag full of money because like I don't know or this country just just bribes this country it's it's all known fact of course of course you know I think there's no such theories are really really based on true but tell me what when let's do this started oh <laughs> That's funny. It was, it was a big change of topic, but I just, I just hold, I just was holding it on my mind a lot of times. I just need to ask. Yeah, I don't. It, it's weird. I don't even know. I think in 2013 or it, it, some maybe in Malmo, um, we were in the press room, and I think Debit and I were talking, and then one of us was like, I think maybe I wanted to do an interview and I was like, I was very nervous and Devin was like, oh, shut up, let's just do this. And so I was like, let's do this. And then it just became this thing, kind of a self-motivational thing. Um, but now I feel it's like an inclusive, like, let's do this like together. Let's let's just do this. Um, I just want to rewind. It's so funny earlier, you mentioned like faking of numbers. Like, I don't even know how to do that. And this is one of the great ironies is this whole blogging process, YouTube process, it's not like I took a course. I just started doing it and you just kind of fake it as you go. Like, okay, um, I'm putting a post. Okay, I'm putting a video. There's no, there was never any plan. There was no like structured plan. And so when people say things like, oh, these numbers are fake. I'm like, how do I even do that? Like what, I, it's, just, it's hilarious because people create such a strong story. And when I look at it, it's like fan fiction, fan fiction. You know, it's like, I'm in a fantasy universe and you see yourself in this fantasy and it, it's actually quite comical in some ways. I, I remember in Finland, when you and I were there, uh, it mm -hmm. was Darud choosing the song. And none of us spoke about how we were voting. But then afterwards, we all voted in like one minute and we had all chosen the same song, mm -hmm. like every single person. And I remember thinking, wow, that's like a very clear result. But in the back of my mind, I was thinking people are gonna say they were in on this together and colluded. But no, sometimes the universe and a, or a song in presentation yeah. Is just so obvious in a certain context. You go. Yeah, for the, it. the right thing is that I remember this Finland thing, and I was then talking to Sebastian Raimond, the singer of Daru, and he was asking me like, "How did it happen? Like, did you really like it?" And I, I said like, "Man, the, I don't know. I liked the, the the other song better when I was listening on on Spotify because was it Superman? Was, uh, yeah, I think so. I, I'm, I, I'm I'm not sure about it, and but." You're performing those two other songs that you don't really care about that and you then you perform this one that you really care about it. So that was kind of simple because the, the, the difference between this and that was with the atmosphere is very different. So probably that all of us just has the same idea had, had the same ideas. And there's nothing really wrong because I, I think that really works when you just watch the Eurovision as well and then you see how countries vote. That always like two countries, three countries, but almost everyone just give points to because they're just like like it, you know. And maybe that's that how it works normally. So uh, there's not, not nothing really like you just cast the vote and let's do this, you know. Let's yeah. <laughs> let's do this exactly. Back to Weebly Blogs and your editorial editorial like background and 
you're not just uh, editorial for your revision, but you, you, your work is editorial in like much bigger scale. So can you tell me more about it, like how did it happen, or what's what's actually your expertise if you just don't count your revision? <laughs> So yeah, I was, um, let's see, so that was 2009. So I had already been working as a magazine journalist for, you know, six six years, I think, before I started Willy Blog. So I worked at the big American news magazines, Time and Newsweek. Um, I came to Europe because I was working in the London Bureau for Time magazine. So I was flying all over the continent reporting, you know, from prisons in Norway and slums in Romania where people were taking drugs and it was about the spread of HIV. Or, you know, I was in Italy interviewing the editor of Vogue Italia. So I was a reporter just going all over Europe writing. And so I, I've always been a journalist asking questions, um, you know, translating European stories for what was an American audience because Time mm -hmm. and Newsweek are American magazines. And then I left in 2012, um, the magazine, and I was freelancing, you know, for many different publications, New York Times, Financial Times, uh, Billboard, just, you know, just writing, because that, that's always been my core skill is writing and reporting. Um, and because I studied psychology as an undergraduate, it kind of gives me, um, I, I like to ask people questions about themselves. You know, it's very, it's very much about seeing from their perspective. And it's just always been the thing I'm interested in. And Eurovision you can apply all those skills to your vision, interviews, you know, motivation on a personal level, on a cultural level, on a political level. So it's an extension of those same skills. And I think for me, when I left my, you know, steady job in 2012 to kind of be on my own, I turned to Eurovision as a way to, I guess, give myself structure. Because when you leave a job, when you're in a job, you have, you know, you know the rules you know the groundwork, you have, you know your deadlines, the publishing schedule, the circulation, your audience. But when you go on your own, it suddenly, all of that goes away. And so you can get very lost if you don't somehow structure yourself or say, okay, I'm gonna do this, this many hours a week and this. So I needed Eurovision to give me some sort of outlet, like a steady outlet. Because when you're a freelancer writing for magazines, you're just selling yourself everywhere. <laughs> you know, it gets quite distracting, yeah. quite stressful. But like I had my blog. And so I really started investing my time and energy much more into that and um, going on trips to national selections because I suddenly had the time. And then, you know, if I was in, I don't know, Belarus or whatever, I would write a story for a magazine about Belarus. And so it becomes this, it was a way for me to see Europe while also forcing me to find freelance stories to pay for my trips. And yeah, it was it was the wilderness, to be honest. Um, how many of them did you make? Uh, trips. Or, or trips and articles, like oh. for one, one Eurovision article, how many other articles you have to make to, to make it work? <laughs> I'm curious. I, yeah, it's, I mean, it really varies. I've done thousands of articles, like honestly, because like all you do as a journal, print media is just write articles. I mean, literally thousands. I don't even, but in terms of like, if we talk about like financials, it can really vary. So I remember in 2015, in May, uh, no, I'm sorry, March 2015, I had done a big story for Bloomberg Business Week about Melody Festival. In, and like, obviously that's a business magazine. So a business magazine pays a lot more money than like, I don't know, a horticulture magazine. I've written stories about flowers, you know? It just, it really varies. Um, but what, I guess this goes back to earlier. We talked about the cycle, like in the beginning of the year, views are very high. So, you know, there's more, there's more Eurovision stuff to do. But then the second half of the year, it's much more quiet. So I would kind of structure my freelance life from maybe June until December, I was writing many articles for mainstream media, I guess. And then in the spring, it was much less. Um, but then I would try to do stuff that paid better to make up the difference, if that makes sense. And to give you more time to yeah. to do what you like. Yeah, and you have to really, it's just, it's a lot to take on. Cause you know, then you have to manage your, you're having to man, people I think sometimes think you're just living your Eurovision best life and you know, going on trips and like listening to music. And that's, I think that's beautiful. I think that's great. But Probably there's another side to it, like everything else. Like it's not a vacation, but it's it's the greatest, the the, the best job you can do because it's something you love. Yeah, but it's like I still have to feed myself, you know, and like take care of my cats and you know pay pay my bills. <laughs> so you have to do lots of dirty work, not dirty work, but normal, not fun work. 
the husband, luckily. <laughs> they're my two children. It's, um, they're scratching at the door now, but I won't let them in or they'll jump in the camera and they won't go away. Tell me how you and Dippin get together, because like I, I really think that's, that's a great duo, like crazy eccentric people, the show you can do, that's really funny. You know, Devin is a mystery to me. He's always been a mystery to me. He's very, we're very similar, but very different. You know, it, it's funny because he, of course, is Nigerian born British and I'm Vietnamese American born in Europe. So we come from completely <laughs> different backgrounds. Um, we met in Dusseldorf in 2011 during the semifinals. I was with my good friend from university who's American who lives here. And we looked to our left and Deben was taking notes during the semifinal. And I said to my friend Venu, I said, why is that guy taking notes during the show? Shouldn't he watch the show? And then we were kind of the whole show looking at his notebook. Like, and, and it was like, words, show. <laughs> it was like words like fabulous, difficult voice. Like, all, like, what is he doing? So afterwards we were like, um, excuse us, why did you take notes? And he gave some ridiculous answer. I don't even remember what he said, but then we kind of just forgot about him. But then six months later in London at this very big, there was like a, a church and Azerbaijan had rented this big church to celebrate Ellen Nikki. And so we both went to this event. There were hundreds of people there and Ellen Nikki were walking around singing and um, somehow Debit and I bumped into each other. And he has very, you know, you can't miss him. He has, you know, his fashion is very loud. And, and I saw him come up, he came up to me and he was like, I want a blog for Wee Wee Blogs. And I was like, who even are you? And anyway, we started talking. And then he wrote an article about Girls Aloud. And so he was one of the first, like, I think maybe he was the third or fourth Wee Wee blogger. And yeah, we just, what I like about Devin is he's pushed me to come out of my shell because maybe when I moved here, I was a bit more guarded. I mean, I had been here for a while then, but I was a bit more guarded. And like, certainly I would never do video. That was like, it was, it horrified me. And you're great in it after all, so. You're very kind. <laughs> no, that's true. It took a while to figure out that, yeah, to get confidence, I guess. And he sort of gave me confidence because he was at the other extreme. He was like, I'm ready, let's go, let's do this. And I'm like, do we have to? <laughs> But it worked out. So, you know, you need, I think you need on your journey, it's nice to have other people with different skills, different attitude, even if you don't always agree, because it makes you, the discomfort is good. And I think being uncomfortable was perhaps the best thing that could have happened because it, it forced, you know, it made the website grow and it made, it created a community. And you grew up as well, with like 11 years are 11 years, which is, which is fascinating actually to me, what, what, what job you've done. And I really, really appreciate it. And I'm really like, that's the last thing actually I want to, to ask you. And maybe it's gonna be personal, But I, I really want to know what's your biggest or the best experience regarding to Eurovision you ever had. And it shouldn't be, it, it's, it can be song, it can be like whatever situation, whatever. It's not about songs, it's about you. So I'm really curious, what is it? What was the, wow, this is something I, I will never forget. Oh, that's such a good question. There's so many different examples, but I guess... Hmm. Okay, so one that I have to mention, and this is kind of like overcoming your fears again. It was in Germany in 2018, no, no, 2019, 2019, the national selection. And I was reading the points out for sort of the, they had a panel of 100. Before that, we were all, there were, there were 100 people there, and then me and an, a, a really lovely German woman were standing there behind this wall, and then the wall starts to open. And it's like, I just remember this freak out moment, like, oh my God, <laughs> we're walking into this cauldron of these people and there's cameras. And it was just, I don't know, I just felt, I, I was very, very nervous. But then you feel like kind of a sense of accomplishment, like, okay, I, I can now do this. Like, the, I, I can actually do this. And it's just, because I was very shy. The thing is, people don't realize I was so shy. I didn't speak till I was six years old because I had this crippling, like, like fear of speaking. And I think it's because... I was, I knew that I knew something was different. I didn't know it was gay, but I knew it was something inside me that was different. And I just didn't speak. And so people thought I was autistic. They told me I was stupid. They told me I was slow. And then I kind of thought about that when the doors were opening and it's like, okay, now you can go say something on TV. And it's like, 
this journey, kind of Eurovision has amplified the personal journey of like feeling voiceless, really, and then feeling like, okay, you know, I have a voice and I can speak, it's okay. At the time stands, I, I really remember me being on Malta and, and I was so nervous to speak and I was, you know, I was always behind the camera, not just in front of it, so it's very different. No one understands it, but it's a very different world. And I was starting to cast my points earlier than I should, so I was like, what the hell? And I was like, no, this is the dumbest thing. I've never been, I've never been in a jury anymore, you know, and it's, it's gonna be like crazy. So, but that, that, that can be really over, that, that's a nice story, actually. I, I, I'm, I'm really glad that you, that, that you, that you share it. That, and I hope your channel will grow you will grow, that, that you'll be staying safe and you'll, you'll be doing better and better articles with, with you bunch of guys and I'm super glad that you take, that, that, you, that you just make time for me even now and it's almost an hour we were talking and I probably can talk any, any other more, any more, more hour? Like how, how to say it, you understand me. Okay. My broken English is horrible sometimes and I don't know what to say and then I start mumbling, you know, and that's crazy, but I, I think you all just get get used to it, so you understand me perfectly. So thank you very much, William, again. Sorry? Thank you so much. I just want to say before we go, and I think it's known among Eurovision fans and certainly among producers that you were so important in helping the Czech Republic develop its voice at Eurovision to continue this thing. It made the Czech Republic go from, I don't want to say a laughing stock, but maybe a country people didn't think of at Eurovision to now a country people get excited about. And it's a lot of it, well, most of it probably is down to all of your hard work and your team's hard work. So congratulations and thank you because thank it you gives us something else to talk about and enjoy. Uh, ESCZ is something we love to watch. Yeah, me too in the future. Hopefully they're gonna continue with this format, we'll see. So uh, that's it, that was William Lee Adams from Baby Block. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan, that was super fun. <laughs>